let's start with the Bochum result because this is a huge point for VfL Bochum in the relegation battle. And a lot of teams around Hertha have point, picked up big points, right? Um, we get to talk about Schalke in a moment as well. Dortmund, and at the time when we saw the situation, um, the Karim Adeyemi foul, and I think it's, sometimes it's really good to just reflect for 48 hours and let it all wash over you and you know see see the reactions come in i think it's pretty mm. safe to say that the dfb missed one here um that this was a penalty the uh, stegemann admitted this as much himself i actually think that the way he explained it uh, makes this look even worse because one of his things that he said on i think it was on doppelpass that dortmund player should have protested even louder to ensure that he looked at this again it just it's a bad picture. I, you know, Dortmund fans will feel aggrieved, and I think they have a point. But you should not rely on a penalty to beat Bochum. You should never, yeah. ever rely on a penalty to beat Bochum. And I think this is where, like, maybe the Dortmund fans have it right to complain about the referee. But at that point, it should have already been 2-3-1 for Dortmund. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I mean, first things first, it was a penalty. Um, I did have kind of some doubts at, in real time. Not really mm-hmm. to the extent yeah. that I thought it was a penalty, but I think it's probably fair to say that Adeyemi does lean into the defender mm-hmm. in this instance. Like, you know, the ball comes across the box and the ball's basically behind Adeyemi, if you yeah. if you, if you catch my drift. Uh, and then the Bochum defender, just kind of like uh, Suarez, I think it was, um, really, really stupid slide tackle. I don't know whether he's maybe trying to um, preempt what he thought was an Adeyemi shot. So maybe he's slide tackling in to try and block the slot, the shot. But Adeyemi basically falls over him. Goalkeeper doesn't call it, and it's just kind of blown into this whole thing over the weekend. Whereby, I mean, you had Terzic and Sebastian Kell coming out with some truly remarkable kind of toys out the pram moments where. You had mm. Kel basically saying, um, I actually have the quote here. Um, well, actually, I'll get to Terzic first because I thought Terzic's comments were ridiculous where he basically said, um, you know, I said it last week, it's a once-in-a-lifetime chance for us, maybe a once-in-a-lifetime chance for me to get so close to the championship trophy in my life. And then there are decisions like that. Now, <laughs> you can, you can, we, can, we can argue about yeah. the decisions all day long, but for Terzic to kind of contextualise it within the point that, oh my God, Dortmund are so close, close to getting to a title, um, why isn't the referee bearing that in mind is just truly bizarre. Uh, and then I think the other interesting thing, you maybe, you maybe um, know better than me because I was kind of just flicking through the newspapers uh, and, and the kind of comments this week, or today actually, about the kind of reaction and... Seems as though Stegman's basically said that he didn't hear anything from the but the beat the Cologne bunker, you know, in terms of the, the VAR people. Mm. Um, he wasn't prompted by them to yeah. go back and look at it, which in most typical protocol would be that if he misses that call, they would say to him, maybe you should have a look at that. Yeah. Because I think if I'm not mistaken, VAR, he can only look at VR if he's made a decision and then he looks at VR to see if he's wrong about that decision. But because he didn't make a call, he couldn't go back through too far. I, I don't even know if that's true to be honest. But basically, he says, look, I didn't hear anything in my ear about whether that was the wrong call. Sebastian call. <laughs> Sebastian Kell then says, if you don't use the means you have at your disposal in this situation, you don't watch it, then I think that's negligent, cowardly, and completely wrong. Mm. And, you know, I did actually my newsletter on, you know, whether Dortmund deserved to win the title. This And, and you know... This performance and how they've been performing on the road in particular, and I'll maybe jump into some of those stats in a moment, but mm. it kind of the, the, the thought that came to mind when I was kind of looking at the reaction from the Dortmund hierarchy was there's that old saying, you know, uh, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And I kind of reworded it saying hell hath no fury like a football club scorned because it felt to me like Dortmund suddenly had this tremendous excuse to kind of bail themselves out of dropping two points in this game because yeah. you can absolutely argue that Dortmund should have had a penalty. Just like I think you could probably argue that Takuma Asano should have had a penalty 10 minutes before that when Mats Hummels basically pushed him to the ground in the mm. Dortmund box. I thought I thought that was a pretty clear penalty, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but for Dortmund to argue that that penalty called 
Um, was the reason that they dropped two points in this game just bizarre to me because I yeah. thought, you know, I actually watched the game in real time. I watched the game back today, Monday afternoon, and there's actually only maybe two, two and a half chances that Dortmund create in that second half. There's um, there's the Daniel Malin kind of back heel about 10 minutes from time. Makuku has a really clear-cut chance when he comes on, completely fluffs his chances there. And I think Jude Bellingham has a half chance with a kind of late-run shot into the box. And that's it. There's, there's really nothing else from Dortmund yeah. in that second half. And although they kind of did a decent job in the first half of kind of pulling it back after the goal goal down, and maybe should have scored a second in this first half, they had they were asked huge questions of themselves in the second half, and it just didn't live up to um, or didn't match that standard. So I don't know. I feel like it, we can spend. I mean, I, I know we have to kind of talk about it because obviously mm. that's just the way it is. But I feel like Dortmund kind of moaning and complaining the referee kind of cost them this game and potentially has cost them the league title is yeah absolutely nonsense to be honest with you because. You know, if you kind of look at Dortmund's away form in particular, where they've been dropping points for fun, they've only picked up, I think, six wins from 14 games on the road this season. They've got the fourth best away record. Uh, we saw this against Stuttgart not so long ago. They continue to drop points. It's their own fault that they are now second in the league. And it's their own fault that they're now probably... I mean, I'm not going to say they have thrown away the league title because it's still plenty of football left to play, but... <laughs> They're in this position because it's their own fault. It's not because of the, the referee or, or one bad penalty call. Yeah, I had some people suggest to me that uh, Manuel Riemann had the game of his life and that the Bellingham chance that you're pointing out, he makes it look good, you know, but having been a goalkeeper myself, we love a shot like that. It's easy to stop, but looks fantastic, right? Because you get to dive, um, but in the end of the day, it is not, it isn't, it's not a difficult save to make if you are a Bundesliga goalkeeper. Looks good on TV. He had a few moments like that. So like there was people saying like, oh, Riemann had like game of his life. This game was like an absolute fluke. I'm like, did he though? I mean, it was definitely a game that he enjoyed because he got to do the things that goalkeepers love to do, which is diving and, you know, making saves look good. But none of these stops were extremely difficult. Um, and what I kind of missed in this Dortmund game in the attack is that sort of urgency that they had in the last 10, 15 minutes where they did really push. A couple of things that stood out to me here is that oftentimes they would take one or two touches rather than take one touch, right? When you play against a team like Bochum that is in a defensive block like that, playing literally for their lives, right? Because they're in the relegation battle and this point is enormous for them. Um, then you have to be more precise in the chances that you are taking. Um, you add to the fact that this is a derby Right, this is a game that is comes with all this adage that we explained in the previous show. You just have to be more precise in, in in your in your finishing situations. I actually thought that Dortmund's response to going down one 0 was excellent. We you know the equalizer came right away, and then I thought, okay, well they equalized but within two minutes. It's like this will pave the way for them to actually win this game, right? Because like the response was, oh, we go down one 0 Two minutes later, Adeyemi with a one touch, one touch uh, score equalizes. Right, that is how you execute the attacks. And then, sort of, nothing happened after that. They didn't have the urgency to right away build on the equalizer. And I think, like, the more the minutes kind of, I had the sense, like, oh yeah, we have like another. It was kind of like we have another forty-five minutes to equalize. We have another 30 minutes to equalize. We have another 20 minutes to equalize. The missed penalty happens. It's like, okay, we still have another 15 minutes to equalize. We have another 10 minutes to equalize. Oh crap, we're running out of time. We have to eat. We have to like, we have to go score the go ahead. And then all of a sudden it clicked, right? But it was too little or too late. They have them puffed. That urgency was way too late. You have to put a team like Bochum to sword the moment you score the equalizer. And that never happened. And I think that is something where that you see quite often with Dortmund. It's either. They lack the urgency when they when they score a big goal like that. I mean, the Stuttgart one was a great example. Just make make it three two, just wrap it up, and then they just kind of stop, right? Um, and this is just not something you can do if you want to win the title. Look, those two points and the two points against Stuttgart, you'd be what like three points ahead of Bayern Munich now. That probably would be enough to win the title. So Terzic and Kiel, that's where I'm kind of laughing. It's like it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to win the title and the referee takes it away from, from us. It's like 
well, you know, at the end of the day, you've been dropping points from winning situations against Bremen, against Stuttgart. Um, this was unnecessary. Like, you know, once at one point when Bayern gives you a massive assist like that, you got to convert. And I'm not sure it's a once in a lifetime opportunity because like we get to talk about Bayern and all the issues in a moment, but you know, this would be a good, like, the Bundesliga needs the 10 year run to end at some point. And Dortmund can complain about the referee as much as they want. We had plenty of situations this year where Bayern Munich fans were aggrieved. You know, how long, how long did we talk about that Upamecano red card against Gladbach? Right. And they had plenty of situations where they were unhappy about the referee and the decisions that were made against them. And we were critical about Bayern then as well on this podcast for saying, well, they also weren't good enough. So, you know, you can, two things can be true at the same time, right? A referee could come up with a decision that was, that didn't favor you, but you could still be not good enough at the same time to win the game. And I think in this game, both those things are true. Stegemann should have given Dortmund a penalty. That was the wrong call. The, the VER team should have interfered. They did not, for whatever reason, did give Stegemann the indication to, to look at this again, which he should have, right? But Dortmund should have still won the game regardless. And I think in this case, both those things are true. And I think we are rightfully sitting here criticizing them for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, just set the record straight. You can be on, you can, you can quite easily say Dortmund should have had a penalty I think Bochum should have had a penalty too to be honest right so you yeah. can say they should have had a penalty but also say that's not an excuse for not winning this game and mm. I felt like the really interesting thing about this match was that Daniel Malin really hit the got out of the blocks really fast in this game he was tremendous yeah. in that first half we've seen this happen quite a few times now where he has a really good first half and then he starts to look quite tired I know he almost got a spectacular uh, goal in this you know second half of that kind of back heel thing um, but it's really interesting how Dortmund have almost kind of slotted into this kind of comfort zone of thinking, because Malin has been so outstanding recently, I think he's either scored or assisted like mm. the last seven or eight games in a row now. Um, it's almost like this front line has kind of started relying on him to kind of create or score goals, you know? Yeah. Um, but then if you actually kind of look at their Bundesliga form in general and the players who are scoring goals in the league, it's actually quite bleak. I mean, Julian Brandt is the club's top goal scorer in the Bundesliga this season with yeah. eight goals. And Yusufa Makuku is second with seven goals. This is a guy who hasn't started a game for Dortmund in, what, two or three months, maybe? I mean, don't get me wrong, he comes on, he's a good sub, and he's still a great young player. But he was very notably replaced by Sebastian Haller after the turn of the you know turn of the year, when once Haller came back. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I think, I think Jude Bellingham could provide a lot more goals. We saw him have some chances in this game. He missed uh, with that kind of one shot in particular. But mm. the whole front line for me just really isn't kind of carrying its weight. We talk a lot about how Bayern miss a striker, but I think Dortmund mm. have really lacked the kind of talisman in this game. Not in this game, sorry, but just in, in the league in general. And relying on like the Brants and Makukus and even Malin to an extent to kind of um, yeah. drag Dortmund through matches like this, I think really shows the kind of vulnerabilities in this team and the frailty of this team. And... I don't know. I, I feel like I, I, I kind of tweeted after, I, I kind of did like a kind of post-match kind of roundup on Substack, uh, on a Substack note. Mm. And I had a subscriber ask me saying, well, you know, regardless of how they finish this season, do you think there'll be a big turnaround in players? And I said, well, I think it'll be evolution rather than revolution. And to which he then says, well, what, pos what positions do you think they need to replace? <laughs> to which I, I, I then basically outlined about seven or eight positions that probably yeah. need some change. And I said, well, actually, now that I think about it, maybe it does need to be kind of, maybe they do have to kind of chop up this team and rebuild it from scratch. Which then makes you wonder, well, where, what, what, what actually is this Dortmund team right now? Is it the start of something small? Or is it something small that's beginning to grow into something big? Is Terzic kind of building the kind of foundations for a squad that's mm. going to get added to in the summer uh, or despite pushing Bayern all the way this season are Dortmund going to have to still have to basically sell off a number of these players move on a number of these players and rebuild again and his next season going to be another transition season because I look at that kind of performance against Bochum and I do kind of wonder like where's the kind of long term planning here where's mm. the where's the spine of this team that's going to be here for the next four or five seasons and who are the players that are going to be relied upon because it does kind of feel like from week to week, 
And look, to be honest, a lot of clubs are like this right now because it's been a very heavy season. We've had the World Cup, so I don't want to just kind of blame Dortmund for this. And God knows we'll dig into Bayern in a moment. But yeah. um, it does feel like Dortmund are just kind of going from one week to the next, kind of hoping that someone shows up and wins in the game. And it has been Daniel Malin recently, but he did his part by creating a goal in the first half. Mm. And in the second half, when they needed someone to put the ball in the back and then they just didn't have anyone to step up and, and be counted. Ja, yeah, there was a really good tweet by uh, Tobias Escher von Spielverlagerung uh, in German. Uh, I retweeted it and he basically said, if Dortmund win the, Me the Meisterschaft, which is still very much possible, this title race is far from being over, um, essentially because I think everyone knows that Bayern is still going to drop points and we'll get to them in a moment. But he, what he said is like, if Dortmund win the championship, which is very much possible, every a lot of people will talk about their mentality, their strength of mentality, etc., and completely overlook that this team is still fundamentally flawed. And that's true. This team is still fundamentally flawed. And this is they, they will win the title because everyone else was not strong enough to win the title either. Um, and that's, I, I mean, this is true for whoever wins the title in the end of the day. We can basically take that entire statement and say that about Bayern. Yeah. Can I also add another, can I throw another thing in there? Uh, Reese Edwards, who writes for Get German Football News, um, who is at underscore Reese Edwards on Twitter. He did a really good thread actually today, uh, May 1st, on you know breaking down and analysing Dortmund's performance. And he basically made a really good point of un uh, underlining how they had 64% possession but just did not create any chances. So I definitely recommend people go have a go find him on Twitter and have a yeah. look at that thread if you're interested. 